Yeah, I'm ready. Perfect. All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our afternoon uh, Hatfield Research Seminar. Um, my name is Cinnamon Moffat, and I am the Research Program Manager at OSU's Hatfield Marine Science Center in Newport, Oregon, and I'll be your host for our talk today. Um, a couple of logistics before we get started. Um, as you might have noticed, your mics, cameras, and screen share have been disabled. Um, we ask that you keep it that way for this talk. Um, we do encourage you to interact with us and ask questions, but please use the chat box at the bottom of your screen and enter in any questions you might have for Kyle. Um, and we'll get to those at the very end. Um, I also want to let folks know that we are recording today's session and we'll be putting it up on the past seminars page of the HMSC website um, in case you are so excited about today's talk that you would like to share it with others. Um, the other thing that I wanted to just kind of um, put in a plug for is next week's seminar. We have Mary um, Hensicker and Ben Laurel, um, both from NOAA, that are going to be talking about decadal, decadal changes in habitat suitability for Pacific cod larvae in the Bering Sea and Gulf of Alaska. Um, so that'll be next week's seminar se session. So go ahead and join us for that. Um, the other thing that's happening is um, right after this uh, event tonight at 630, we're going to be doing the Story of Plastics Q&A session um, that's hosted by Surfrider. Um, if you haven't signed up for that yet, you still have time. Um, so you're welcome to join us in a panel discussion about plastic um, issues here in Newport. Um, so you're welcome to do that. Um, the other thing I wanted to just ask is that we are doing really great about filling out our seminar series, but we do have a gap on June 25th. So if anybody knows somebody who would like to share with the Hatfield community, um, please let me know and I'm happy to get them on the schedule. Um, but what you're actually here for is to learn a little bit more about today's speaker. So let me just quickly introduce Kyle. Um, Kyle Newman is our speaker today. He is an alumni of OSU's Bioresource Research Program. Um, after completing his degree at OSU, he worked for Marine Systems Specialist at Sexton's Corporation in Salem, Oregon, where he designed and built custom underwater scientific equipment and cameras. Um, Kyle is currently an NSF Graduate Research Fellow and PhD candidate in the Interdepartmental Graduate Program for the Marine Science at the University of California in Santa Barbara. Um, he has worked many years taking his skills um, to sea as an engineer on research cruises in the Atlantic, Caribbean, Gulf of Mexico, and in the Pacific. Um, most recently aboard the NV Nautilus as the lead video engineer. Uh, Kyle, in all of his undertakings, strives to include um, research co-production, stakeholder engagement, and youth education activities wherever possible. And I have had the pleasure of working with Kyle for the last few months. Um, he has been working with us to help set up um, the equipment in the new innovation lab in the new building. So I'm excited to hear a little bit more about what he does in his real job. So Kyle, um, go ahead and take it away. Uh, thank you, Sinman. Thanks for that introduction. Um, I would say, you know, I'm happy to be back at Oregon State, but, uh, you know, here we are. Um, today, uh, I want to talk to you about uh, my PhD work. So I'm a PhD candidate at, in Darren Brickpile's lab uh, at UC Santa Barbara. And I want to talk to you about my work looking at the influence of terrestrial runoff on the health of reefs around Morea, French Polynesia, and how doing things the hard way inspired the development of some new research tools. <clears throat> Sorry, my, there we go, sorry, was not advancing, here we are. So, uh, Maria is in French Polynesia, it's in the South Pacific, about uh, as far south of the equator as Hawaii is north. Uh, it's a high island, so formerly volcanic, um, about 134 square kilometers, and the highest point is over 1,200 meters. So it's a very tall, steep island. You can see it has a really unique uh, sort of triangular um, morphology with these very, very steep, sharply delineated watersheds. Um, when people think about French Polynesia, about Tahiti, which is the island that you can see over here, 
um, which is directly adjacent to Morea. You think about these clear blue lagoons filled with coral and uh, beautiful fish and bungalows built out over the water. So you think about scenes like this. Um, if you've worked in Morea, like quite a few people from OSU have, you might think of um, Morea like this. This is the research station that we work out of. This is a jump station. Um, uh, but I like to think of Morea um, by taking a, a little bit of a step back and looking at the island as a whole from, from ridge to reef um, and think about how all of these systems are connected. Uh, in a place like Morea, that's again very small, very steep watersheds, um, there, the connections between land and sea are, are very tight. So um, the focus of my work is looking at those connections and, and uh, what, how, when you perturb one part of the system, it affects another. Um, French Polynesia, like many places in the world, are experiencing some severe and drastic changes uh, in recent years. So the picture on the left here is taken of myself and my um, lab mate as we were diving on the fore reef around Morea, headed out to a, a research site. Um, this photo on the right was taken a few months later um, in May of 2019 uh, by OSU's own Dr. Andrew Thurber. Um, and it shows the same reef, but severely, severely bleached. Um, <clears throat> moving a little closer inshore to back reef sites. So that previous picture was taken out here on the fore reef. Um, there's a reef crest around these islands. Uh, it's a barrier um, that's exposed at high tide around the island. And then there's this lagoon that has a back reef and a fringing reef. Um, <clears throat> so the Gump Station on Morea is home to the Morea Coral Reef uh, NSF Long-Term Ecological Research Program, who for the past uh, few decade or so, or since 2006, uh, They've been collecting data about the health of corals around the island, um, fish, uh, uh, water, water column nutrients, salinity, a whole host of uh, parameters. Um, <clears throat> one da data set that really inspired my work is this data set here that looks at back reef sites, uh, these six sites around the island of Morea. And looks uh, using photo transects, um, looks at the cover of a living coral with these, which are these represented by these orange triangles here, um, and uh, macroalgae um, represented by these green diamonds. Um, <clears throat> on the north shore of the island, so these sites here, the since 2006, there's been a pretty sharp decline in the percent cover of live coral at those sites and a corresponding increase in the cover of macroalgae, which directly competes with coral for space and resources. Um, on, at sites four, five, and six, uh, we're not really seeing that trend. Um, and they, these pictures, uh, the pictures in the previous slide weren't very good, so I included some of my own, which kind of shows the differences that we're seeing at these sites. So this is a, a back reef site from Morea that shows very healthy, thriving, living coral. There's different species of coral all interspersed. Uh, you don't see a lot of bleached or dead coral. Large schools of fish and a, and a wide variety of fish. Uh, as compared to a site like this, which um, all of this hard structure here used to be living coral, but is now um, is now just coral skeleton with some encrusting coral growing on it. Um, the water's generally more turbid. There aren't nearly as many fish and they tend to be smaller. Um, <clears throat> and these sites are covered with uh, overgrown with macroalgae. In this case, all of these structures here, all these these guys here, these are all um, uh, macroalgae called turbinaria um, that tends to come in and colonize um, open hard substrate on the reef, uh, especially after coral has died off. And then it 
competes with coral for re resettling on those spaces. Um, <clears throat> our lab went out and collected uh, turbine area from all around the islands, and we were interested in, in tissue uh, nutrients um, in, the, in the macroalgae. So we collected turbine area from all around the islands, and we analyzed the algal tissue for uh, percent N, which is what you see here, as well as the ratio of 15N to 14N. Um, <clears throat> and what we see from those data are these hot spots of nitrogen on the islands. Um, so here and he on the North Shore, where we're seeing these declines in, in reef health in particular, we have a very large hot spot of nitrogen, uh, as well as down over here, where uh, which was also included in those sites that were declining. Um, and when I saw this figure, um, it really made me think um, about the morphology of the islands. And it, to me, it maps on really well with the large um, watersheds on the islands uh, and the watersheds that have the largest rivers on the islands. So I like this image taken from the ISS. Uh, of, of Morea, you can really see how sharply delineated these watersheds are, how, sh how steep the, the upper slopes are, and, um, and you can get a sense of um, where the rivers and where the development uh, on the island are. Um, <clears throat> getting closer to ground level and, and thinking about what human activity looks like on the islands. Um, so this picture is a picture that I took driving up into the mountains, looking at uh, land that is being cleared for new pineapple plantations. Uh, you can see right here, this is a river um, where all the riparian uh, vegetation has been stripped out. And um, all, all of this, all these slopes will be planted with pineapples. Um, and <clears throat> there's also a lot of development on the islands. Um, the population of Marae is rapidly increasing. And so there's more and more demand for places to build houses. Uh, because the island is so steep, um, these watersheds are so steep, most of the usable land has already been used on the island. It's either already has crops on it or there are already buildings. And so to make room for new houses, um, we're seeing a, uh, in recent years, have, we've been seeing a lot of development that looks like this, a lot of land clearing where all the vegetation is being stripped off. And then um, that land is being terraced into flat sections so that um, these houses can be built, built on them. Um, unfortunately, often the, de the developer and the home builder are two different groups. And so a developer will come in and buy this land and prepare it for home building and then put it up for sale. And it may be safe for sale for years before somebody buys it and builds houses on it. So this property in particular has been bare like this for a couple of years. And you can see as it rains, um, this is just a perfect, perfect storm of erosion where you have really steep slopes, very erodible soils and no vegetation. Um, in both of these photos, uh, there is a river uh, closely adjacent. Um, in this first photo, it's right behind the camera. And on this photo, it's just to the left of this road here. And it drives this point home that uh, Maria is sort of running out of easily usable land. This is a development project that's being proposed on the island right now which would cut 65,000 cubic meters of soil uh, out of the mountain to fill in a low-lying area that floods at high tide um, to build some luxury homes and some new industrial development. Um, <clears throat> maybe not surprising, but Maria being a tropical island, it rains a lot. Um, this is a video that I took when I was out there in the rainy season. Um, there are periodic rainstorms throughout the year, uh, but there's a season, uh, usually about a month and a half long, of just heavy, heavy rain. Um, and pretty much every day tends to look like this. Um, after these rainstorms, you get uh, 
course, a lot of flow in the rivers around the islands, um, and the water gets very turbid. Um, <clears throat> this video, video demonstrates a couple of really important things about the rivers on the islands. One is that, uh, or just to get a sense of scale first, uh, from this cemented roadbed to the underside of the bridge is about three meters. So it's, this is a relatively large river. Um, and uh, uh, the rivers, and especially in their lower reaches, have been, the banks have been fortified with these large stones um, for flood control. Uh, but what that's meant, that's encouraged quite a lot of erosion, as you can see here. And what that, that's meant is that the uh, river has scoured downward. Um, that uh, is important when thinking about different sources of water that might be in, entering the river. So uh, here's another photo um, taken after a rainstorm on the island of one of the more impacted watersheds. And you can see the river is very, very turbid. Um, and you can see more of this fortification here. Um, <clears throat> so when you have um, very porous bedrock, um, as you, on, as you do on volcanic islands like Morea, um, there's a lot of groundwater flow that occurs. And in the lower reaches of, of the rivers, um, you get a fair amount of groundwater discharge entering the river as in addition to the, um, the, surf, the overland and, and surface uh, storm flow that you would normally think of as, as runoff. So, um, Keep that in mind when um, I talk a little bit later about collecting water samples from these streams, um, that this is, um, that all the water samples were collected as low in the watershed as possible before the river mixed with seawater. And so it represents some mix of groundwater and surface water. Um, <clears throat> as, the, as these rivers flow out into these, these bays and, and the lagoons around the island. Um, even after medium to large rainstorms, the, these entire bays will just be um, really, really turbid with this very fine clay sediment um, that tends to lack, stick around for a few days afterwards. Um, and we think about the effect that this might be having on coral reefs. There's a ton of amazing work um, that has been done looking all around the world on the effects of dissolved inorganic nutrients like dissolved, like nitrogen and phosphorus, um, as well as sedimentation on all of these important factors of, um, uh, for coral and reef health. Um, the biggest takeaway here is that sedimentation tends to be really, really bad um, for corals um, for a number of reasons. And <clears throat> dissolved inorganic nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus uh, can have some positive effects, but they tend to encourage the growth of macroalgae like turbinaria that I mentioned before, which competes with coral for space and resources. Um, when we started looking at rivers around the island, we saw there were these really large differences in, um, in turbidity regimes uh, as well as nutrient regimes. So um, even within the, within the same watershed. Um, <clears throat> so this river flows uh, through some pineapple plantations and also through uh, a part of a town, whereas the river that I was standing in when I took this photo flows directly out of the mountains um, through a really forested part of the island. And you can see that there are very stark differences in turbid area, or sorry, in turbidity between these two rivers. Um, and when we collected water samples from these rivers, there are also very stark differences in the nutrient concentrations in these rivers. So this river here that is really turbid also is really high in dissolved in organic nitrogen. Whereas this river here, uh, that is much less turbid, is very low in dissolved inorganic nitrogen um, and is relatively a little higher in, in dissolved inorganic phosphorus. Uh, 
just drive this point home a little bit more. Uh, these water samples were all collected on the same day after a rainstorm from different rivers around the island. And you can see that uh, on the left here, these samples are very, very turbid. These are upward, up towards 900 or 1,000 milligrams per liter of total suspended solids, whereas uh, these down here are much lower. And these samples also represent a gradient of, of nutrients. Uh, dissolved in organic nutrients. Um, so that led us to this first question is, what is driving these differences in river and sediment and nutrient regimes on, on Morea? And just from uh, exploring the island and spending some time on it, it really seemed like there were stark differences in, in the amounts of land use uh, between different watersheds. And so that's where we decided to to focus on, on what might be driving these differences. Um, we went to rivers around the island. We collected water samples from, these, from the rivers, um, looked at nutrients, including dissolved inorganic nitrogen, uh, nitrate, which tends to drive um, the, the, the dissolved inorganic nitrogen in the rivers. Uh, but we also measured nitrite uh, and ammonium, as well as phosphate. Um, and we uh, have samples that we will be running for uh, stable nitrogen isotopes. We collected total suspended solids data, um, as well as microbe data, which we're still working up. And then we collect, collected some stream channel uh, characteristics, as well as water flux measurements from these different rivers. And through all of this, we were informed by local knowledge from our, our partners on the island. Um, who we have engaged with and formed a really amazing uh, collaboration to, to conduct this research. They really guided us to the sites that they thought were important to study, and um, we are in constant communication about the results from this work. Um, <clears throat> so thinking about how land use might be influencing these uh, different parameters, um, Myself and a couple of uh, geography students at UC Santa Barbara uh, started analyzing Landsat imagery uh, of Morea. And we classified um, the, uh, the, the images into, uh, into a, two, a few different classifications. So we looked at, uh, we wanted to identify forested land uh, and cl uh, cleared land, which represents uh, either agriculture or land that has been recently cleared for um, development. We also uh, classified um, settlements. So if we could see buildings in this imagery, um, <clears throat> and then there's a cloud cover classification as well, just to, in case there were clouds over certain parts of the island. Um, so this, this is an image uh, of our classifications uh, from 2003, looking at forested land, which is in the light green, compared to cleared land, which is either, ag again, ag agriculture or uh, development, uh, housing development. Um, and that's in the dark green here. And so if we compare that to that image from 2003 to the image from 2018, we can see that there are some really large differences in the amount of cleared land uh, between 2003 and 2018. And um, just flipping back here and then forward again, um, most of the new cleared land between 2003 and 2018 tends to be on the North Shore in these two valleys here. And there also seems to be a trend of cleared land uh, along um, river paths. So this cleared land is moving up the mountains uh, along either side of a river, as well as this land clearing here and this land clearing here. Um, <clears throat> this is a summary of the percent change that we saw from 2003 to 2018 with these different classifications. The biggest takeaway from, from this figure is that uh, forests in general in these watersheds, forest was lost to cleared land uh, and some settlement. Um, there is some uh, 
it, it seems like sediment is lost in a few of these um, watersheds um, from our classifications, but we think that that is because these were recently built buildings that were then sort of overgrown with tr tree canopy above them. And so between 20, 30, 2003 to 2018, we couldn't see them from the satellite image, but they're definitely still there. Um, looking at just the percent cover of cleared lands from the satellite imagery. Um, so this is cleared land as a percent of the total watershed area in these different watersheds. And this number here is the change in percent um, area um, that it was cleared in that watershed between 2003 and 2018. Uh, so in general, we see a pretty sh striking trend of <clears throat> um, quite a bit of change between 2003 and 2018 in the amount of uh, land that has been cleared in these watersheds with some areas seeing an increase of up to 547%. Um, so, <clears throat> Uh, there is some there are some very rapid uh, rapid scale changes happening in the way that land is being used on the island. Um, so we are curious as to how that might be informing uh, dissolved uh, dissolved inorganic nutrients as well as sediments in the rivers. So I plotted um, just the percent watershed area um, by concentrations collected, um, concentrations of phosphate um, collected from these, these, from these different rivers around the island. And so these are individual samples. It kind of gives you an idea of the spread um, during large rainfall events. You can get large peaks. Um, there's, there's quite a bit of variability in these. Um, all of these samples were collected in the rainy season. They're, uh, is a, maybe a bit of a trend here with, with phosphorus, but again, the bedrock in Marea being volcanic is very uh, rich in phosphorus. So um, it doesn't <clears throat> maybe tell us as much, but total suspended solids, it, it really seems like there is a trend. Um, and to dissolved in organic nitrogen, there seems to be a, a pretty strong trend. And these trends, um, come out even stronger when you look at the mean phosphate concentrations uh, and the max concentrations. So if you look at dissolved phosphate, uh, again, uh, plotted against percent of the watershed area that's been cleared, there is a uh, maybe a weak trend here. Um, <clears throat> but if we look at total suspended solids, we see a, a strong trend where the watersheds that have more area cleared in, in that watershed, there tends to be um, much more uh, total suspended solids in those rivers. Um, and, and the same is true for max total suspended solids concentrations measured in those rivers. So if, um, so this really represents what happens during heavy rainfall events when you have um, a lot of surface runoff carrying a lot of sediment into the rivers. And we have a very, very strong relationship um, with dissolved inorganic nitrogen and um, the percent of watershed area cleared. So uh, this is again, mean dissolved inorganic nitrogen over watershed area cleared and max. Um, so the, the amount of the watershed that has been cleared of forest really strongly predicts the, the amount of nitrogen that we, we see in these rivers. Um, <clears throat> so that led us to another question, which is, is this runoff affecting the community composition, uh, coral bleaching and coral mortality of, that we're observing on near shore reefs around the island? Um, <clears throat> so we selected uh, a subset of these rivers that represent um, different uh, nutrient regimes. So this is a plot of, N, of the N to P ratio of water samples collected from the rivers um, and uh, from rivers all around the island. And you can see that we're, we're covering quite a spread. So some rivers have high nitrogen relative to phosphorus, whereas other rivers have 
more phosphorus than they do nitrogen. Um, and these rivers also the, cover a, um, quite a spread of land use in, in the watershed. So uh, Papatoai has quite a bit of land use. There's a pretty large population that lives in Papatoai, whereas Piahena has a pretty low population and very little agriculture. So we selected these sites, um, nine rivers around the island that empty right on to uh, fringing reef uh, around the island. So fringing reef is reef that is, um, that is directly adjacent to land. Um, there's no lagoon or channel between land and the reef. Um, and, oh, and we also uh, selected these based on a, a, a spread of total suspended solids concentrations. So um, we wanted to um, get, a, get a nice, um, to, to be able to look at total suspended solids and nutrients um, at different levels, how that might be affecting the health of, of reefs that are adjacent to the shore. And how we did that is in uh, August 2019, we went out, um, we laid, uh, we swam transects um, along these fringing reefs uh, from the mouths of rivers. So there here's a river exiting um, into the lagoon right here. There's a bridge here. You can see there's a lot of deposition of sediment right here. Um, and so we swam transects um, moving away from the river mouth uh, towards, um, or just, yeah, just moving away from the river mouth. And um, we, to, uh, to do these transects, we swam with a float that had a GoPro mounted on it um, that, that was taking a photo every second. And on, mounted to the top of the float was a GPS. Um, it was re recording our position every second so we can geo-reference each of the photos taken along these transects. Um, in the beginning of the transects, uh, we tend to see, uh, tend to see reef, if you could call it that, that looks like this. Um, a lot of terrigenous sediment, this brown sediment you see here. A lot of algae um, like Cadina and Dictyota, uh, some very, very hardy coral species, um, some small colonies, um, but not usually nothing much larger than half a meter in diameter. Um, and as you move away from the river, um, you move towards reefs that look like this, which uh, the sediment is more calciferous. Um, the water is much less turbid, and there are large colonies of coral and different species of coral. <clears throat> so, as you can imagine, swimming these long transects, taking a photo every second, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of photos. It's quite hard to analyze uh, all of those photos by hand. So, we've been using this really amazing tool developed by uh, UC San Diego called CoralNet. Um, where we can upload photos, uh, we generate a series of points on those photos. Um, we're using a stratified random sampling um, of 48 points on, on these photos, where we are, we're still in the process of analyzing these photos, but um, as we go along, we're training uh, an AI bot to recognize the recognize cor the coral and algal uh, genus in the photos, as well as sediment type, uh, turf growing on hard substrate, rubble, uh, urchins, a whole host of different things. Um, <clears throat> and how we do that is we have uh, a library of labels that we have determined that we will probably see uh, on these, in these transects. And we go through and um, the bot predicts what it thinks is in each one of these circles, and then we tell it what is in each one of those circles. Um, and over time, um, we are teaching it to be able to recognize things. Um, so far, 
that bot, uh, we trained it, it's about 65% accurate in making those, um, making those labels. So right now, <clears throat> um, this is with 319 images. Um, so right now, 65% isn't really great, but it does make it a lot faster for us going through these photos by hand as we're training the bot. Um, because 65% of the time or so, the bot is correct in its identification. We can just confirm that instead of uh, IDing it ourselves. Um, so, so slowly over time, we're getting these bot, this bot trained to be able to analyze these photos. Um, of course, we'll have to go back and, and make sure that the bot is doing it correctly, but um, it's a really, really amazing tool, again, developed by UC San Diego. And um, it's been really powerful for analyzing these large uh, photo transects like this. <clears throat> so this work is again ongoing um, for these photo transects an analyses. We're looking at coral and algal community composition, um, coral bleaching, and coral mortality along gradients at individual sites, moving away from the mouths of rivers, and also between sites. So um, by selecting sites that, have, that cover a range of nutrient and sediment runoff regimes, um, we can look at how those might be impacting the trends that we're seeing in community composition, coral bleaching, coral mortality on these uh, sites. And we also have a project um, in collaboration with uh, the Vega Thurber Lab at Oregon State looking at the microbial community composition in the rivers um, and comparing the composition uh, of the microbial community between watersheds and also looking at how nutrient and sediment regimes in the watersheds um, are affecting the microbial communities in those rivers. Um, <clears throat> so all of this work, I should say, was done the old-fashioned way, was done by hand. These water samples were collected mostly by myself, driving around the island to different sites, collecting water samples in a bottle, putting them in a cooler, driving back to the research station, uh, analyzing those samples. Um, and throughout this whole process, doing this over multiple seasons, over multiple years, it really struck me that there are probably some very important moments that we were missing. Um, in that uh, being, a, again, a small, really steep volcanic island in a tropical place that rains a lot, um, <clears throat> there are big pulse runoff events um, where the river will go from base flow all the way to flood stage uh, very, very quickly, and uh, it would be great to be able to capture that. Um, unfortunately, uh, the times that we tried to put some autonomous uh, or some some loggers out there, we put pressure loggers out. Um, those devices kind of disappeared, and we were worried about tampering, so we couldn't use like ISCO samplers, which is this sort of standard um, put a you know standard autonomous water sampling system that we, you would use to study rivers. Um, and our budget, unfortunately, didn't allow for a lot of um, really expensive uh, in situ analyzers. So that led me to think about some creative solutions and um, I really drew on my engineering uh, background. Um, and in between collecting water samples, I was in Maria, I was like sketching on the back of, you know, my lab notebooks to come up with some ideas about how we could build a water sampler that could fill in some of these gaps for us. Um, and what we came up with is um, what we're calling PAWS, uh, Programmable Autonomous Water Samplers, aka super cool water sampling robots. Um, so if you went out to a river like this, um, this is one of my favorite sites on, on Maria, and you wanted to know, say like, what is the phosphorus concentration in this river over time? Say over a 12 hour period or a 24 hour period. Uh, and you went and you collected a series of bottle samples 
every four hours, which is a pretty frequent sampling regime, especially if you have many rivers to get to. Um, you might come up with um, a curve that looks like this or a, or a series of points that looks like this. Um, and you could calculate the at a mean uh, phosphorus concentration in that river of, over that 12 hours of 1.6 micromolar. But you might be missing in the sampling regime some really large uh, spikes in runoff um, and uh, infiltration from different sources. And the actual curve may look something like this. And um, that mean is considerably higher, a mean of 2.2 micromolar. So um, bottle sampling can have its limitations. So the current options that are available right now um, for improving resolution in studies like this is to increase this frequency of spot sampling. Um, that comes with increased labor cost. You have to pay someone to sit by a river every hour and collect a water sample, or you need to um, have a whole team of people if you want to collect at ri different rivers simultaneously. Um, there can be a high opportunity cost where you're focusing your energy on one spot and you might be missing something that's going on somewhere else. Uh, again, it's difficult to collect, uh, collect simultaneous samples at multiple sites um, and really difficult to have uh, time paired samples collected from each of those sites. Um, <clears throat> it's very condition dependent. Uh, so if there's a big flood, if it's a rainstorm, if a tree blows down on the road, um, it can be difficult to get to these sites. Um, I know because these are things that I experienced um, firsthand in collecting water samples around Maria. And it requires grad students to stay up all night sampling in the middle of a tropical storm. Again, this is a very personal story where I drove around the islands um, in the middle of the night because it was a big rainstorm and I wanted to capture what uh, flood stage runoff looked like in these rivers and so I drove around the island and trees were falling on the road and could barely see it was raining so hard so they're not there's some definite limitations to bottle sampling. Um, the alternative of course is to deploy in-situ analyzers. Uh, they can be really expensive. I recently got a quote for a SUNA nitrate um, auto analyzer or in-situ analyzer and they wanted something in the neighborhood of $30,000 for it, um, which on a grad student budget is not really feasible. Um, they can be limited in scope in that they only really measure one or two parameters at a time. Um, and so if you wanted to look at, like we did, look at phosphorus, different species of nitrogen, you would need multiple probes. Um, they require regular calibration and maintenance, which you have to train yourself to do or send back to the factory. I can be high risk in that you spend a lot of money in these things and if they get broken or lost, then you're out uh, that investment. And they are often re redundant or maybe less uh, accurate or have a higher um, detection limit than lab-based analyses. So for ammonium, for example, uh, concentrations of ammonium in the rivers around Morea and especially in the reefs around Morea um, tend to be less than um, less than one micromolar and it's as far as I've been able to find there are no in-situ analyzers that can measure at these very very low concentrations sometimes as low as 0.1 micromolar around the um, in these water samples um, but we have lab-based techniques um, like fluorometry that are able to do that um, so there may, if you wanted to increase resolution in some studies like this, there may not even be um, an in-situ analyzer that you can deploy. Uh, so that led us to, led me to write down this wish list, which is I would like a water sampler that can do all of these things. Can be low cost, open source, easy to build, simple, reliable, robust, all of the things that you could ever want in a water sampling robot. How hard could it be to build that thing? So I started prototyping and building and prototyping and testing and breaking and testing and breaking and prototyping and trying things out 
throwing things off of piers. One eternity later, um, we came to this uh, water sampler design. So this is pause. Um, I should put it something in these photos for scale, but it's about two feet long. Um, and uh, this, this tubing is three inches in diameter. Um, and I'm using feet and, and inches here because this is plumbing. These are plumbing parts, this is PVC pipe and PVC unions that you can find at any hardware store. Um, I really wanted this design to be affordable. And again, as being open source, I wanted it to, to be something that you know anyone could build with some pretty basic uh, basic tools. So I spent a lot of time in the plumbing department of Home Depot trying to piece some things together. Um, this is the housing design. Uh, this housing design has been extremely robust. I'm really, really happy with how it turned out. Um, so again, this is PVC, uh, Schedule 40 PVC pipe. Um, these are parts of PVC unions, which uh, have come with this really great O-ring. And then um, I laser cut a couple of discs that sit really nicely on top of these O-rings and make a seal. And that's all held together by these collars here. And I've, I did the calculations on this. They sh they are way more than capable of going to diver depth. And I've taken these housings to, to 70 feet while diving and I've had absolutely no problems. I think that this housing design is very inexpensive, um, maybe $30 and $40 in materials could be used for a whole host of different uh, open source instrumentation. Um, and then the internals that uh, we, I developed um, in collaboration with a couple of en engineering students uh, at UCSB, um, some undergrad students, um, <clears throat> is essentially it's a programmable syringe. Um, so the water sample is collected into a 60 mill milliliter poly polycarbonate syringe that's driven by um, a stepper motor linear actuator that's controlled by a uh, microcontroller um, and uh, has a fairly large battery to run the whole thing. Um, so we uh, designed and 3D printed um, these parts to act as a cradle for, um, to, to lock the syringe in place and to uh, pull the back the plunger on the syringe as well as to mount the stepper motor. Um, to the, the tray and to, to mount these rails um, to the stepper motor. And uh, here's another view. You can see this is the stepper motor linear, linear actuator. This is an off the shelf component. Um, and um, as it turns a little captive nut inside of here, it, uh, it turns, it like um, turns the nut, which moves the screw linearly uh, through the middle of the stepper motor. And then this is a, just a smooth guide rail that we put in, in place uh, to keep everything from getting wobbly. Um, and that's run by this, um, this is an Adafruit Feather M0 uh, microcontroller that we um, uploaded some Arduino code to that we wrote. Um, and then added a little screen on top with some buttons. So you could control things like the dur duration that um, the sampler takes to fill the syringe. There's a delay so that you could, um, you could synchronize multiple of these units at the same time. So they would all start sampling at the same time. You could set them up in the lab and then have, put them out in the field and have them start sampling once they're out in the field. Um, so there's a lot of functionality built in here. We designed these circuit boards ourselves um, and then assembled some off the shelf components onto them. And it's powered again by a sizable um, lithium ion battery, um, also an off the shelf component. Um, and all of that once assembled slides into that housing that I um, showed earlier and uh, put the end cap on it. And <clears throat> there's a small tube, which is an IV, uh, medical grade IV extension tube that connects the, the inlet of the syringe to this pass-through um, 
that has been epoxied into the end of one of those acrylic discs um, that forms the door of this. And um, for our first deployment, uh, we took them out to Morea and um, we're deploying them on a study to think about uh, nutrients that might be um, might be flexing out of the sediment on reefs um, and think about how microbes might be breaking down uh, organic matter that has been de deposited and that it might be sort of time re release nutrients that the reef would be experiencing. So we just deployed a couple of the pause systems alongside of um, some uh, standard um, sediment efflux chambers. Unfortunately, the results from this study, this was also done in collaboration with um, uh, Andrew Thurber at Oregon State. Um, unfortunately, the samples went back to Oregon State, um, but they were lost in the fire in Bird Hall. Um, so I don't have the results to show from, uh, from our first uh, couple of test runs of the, this as it relates to Maria unfortunately, because those samples were all melted or caught fire or whatever. Um, but four years and many iter iterations later, um, I, we're really happy with how these samplers are working. So they collect a single uh, integrated sample. That's an important thing to note is that um, over the deployment period, um, which is programmable, it could be one minute, it could be 24 hours, um, it collects one integrated sample into that syringe, which would could represent, um, you know, an average nutrient concentration in that in the water body over that period of time. Um, so we constructed it from mostly off-the-shelf components, many of which can be found in your local hardware store. The remainder of the parts were manufactured using a 3D printer and a laser cutter, which are readily available, increasingly more readily available. And as soon as the iLab is open at Hatfield, it'll be very readily available. Um, so everyone can have access to 3D printers and laser cutters and could build as many of these, these samplers as they want. Um, <clears throat> they're assembled using a few hand tools and, and some off the shelf epoxy. They're easily customizable, so you could change the size of the syringe. Um, the sampling period is easily programmable, with just uh, adjusting a couple buttons. There's a delay function, and then it's really easy, easy to attach all sorts of different things to this. So we use filters, which, um, key, which keep uh, microbes from entering the syringe to act as a, a sort of a preservative uh, to keep nutrient concentrations from changing over time. Those same filters could be then used to look at the microbial community that's on those reefs over those periods of time. But they could also be connected to different chambers, different sort of filtration uh, systems, different collection um, uh, containers like bags or tubes or things like that. Um, and we water tested everything to uh, four atmospheres, uh, so equivalent to 40 meters water, water depth. Um, so very uh, deployable, it's in, easily deployable in, in, in rivers, um, which, me, which is a nice improvement over, say, ISCO samplers, which have to sit on the bank. Um, and they have a whole, usually people have to build a metal casing around them so they don't get tampered with. These samplers can be deployed in situ underwater um, all the way beyond diver depth. And in the end, they cost only around. Uh, 300 US dollars. So um, with that, I will take any questions that anyone has. Thanks, Kyle. Um, and thanks for doing a, just an amazing plug for the Innovation Lab. Oh, <laughs> sure. Yeah. People excited about what's coming up. Um, yeah, yeah. For anybody that's online, if you want to type in questions, we're ready to take those. And while we give everybody a chance, Kyle, can you? Um, Talk to me a little bit, and I'm sure you've thought about discrete sampling um, mm -hmm. options. Uh, what is your vision for something like that? It seems like that is the next step for a sampling device like this. Sure, yeah. And for a lot of the work, um, a lot of this work that we did in Marea, um, the integrated sample could 
actually in some ways be better than discrete sampling because it would um, it covers all those times when you would have gaps in between discrete samples. Um, and it would give us an average over some larger time periods. And what we're really thinking about with this study is average fluxes of these of nutrients and sediment out onto the reef. And so individual samples, you know, we're kind of already averaging them together. Um, and so this just sampling in, in an integrated fashion sort of averages it already, but it also reduces um, the time and cost of analyzing samples. So instead of having a sample every hour for 24 hours, you have 24 samples, you have all that time and cost associated, you just would have one. Um, that being said, uh, I have experimented with um, uh, similar to if folks are familiar with Osmo samplers, um, which is a, a type of sampling that's used in uh, a lot often in deep sea work. Um, the water sample in sort of a continuous fashion, uh, like this, you know, continuously drawing in a syringe, the Osmo sampler uses um, some really creative uh, chemistry, but um, um, the syringe is continuously drawing in a sample. And if you connect, connect the inlet of that syringe to a very, very long coil of small diameter uh, tubing, like less than one mil, millimeter inside diameter tubing, um, then, and, the, and the, the sample collection is slow enough, you get what's called plug-like flow in there. And so the sample stays relatively discrete in that the first bit of sample that was collected in the first hour fills one length of that tube. This, the second hour fills the second length and so on and so forth. And if you know the pumping rate, um, you can, and, and how, and the volume of a certain length of tube. Um, so for one mil, millimeter inside diameter, it'd be like one meter of, of tubing is one milliliter of water. So <clears throat> you could go back and you can divide the tube into sections. And that's a way that you could use this sort of continuous sampling mechanism to get discrete sampling um, is to use very long coils of tubing and, and divide it up. But it's something we've played around with and it is definitely feasible. It, it does make the system a little more complex and a little more expensive. So we're getting a couple of questions. Um, this first one kind of goes back to um, your sampling results. Do you have any measurements of underground water in this area that might explain why your N and P don't match in rain events? Um, we don't uh, yet. So there's an, um, another project that is ramping up in Marea that is specifically looking at groundwater. So it'll, it'll be really exciting to um, look at our results and compare it to their results and see what groundwater, how groundwater might be playing into this. Um, we did analyze a series of samples for silicate as well to help us tease apart how much groundwater might be um, entering in, into our water samples or how, what kind of relative ratio of groundwater to surface water we have in our, in our water samples. We're still kind of figuring out what that means. Um, I do think that groundwater has plays quite a big role here, and um, and in a place like Marea, where you have a lot of phosphorus in the bedrock, but the bedrock is also very porous. So anywhere you put a septic system, that that or a cesspool, it's not really very well contained by the bedrock, and so. Um, there's certainly more work that it, it needs to be done in Marea thinking about how all of these, these different sources of nutrients might come into play. Yes. Um, I have a question about your sampling device, your pause. Um, what are the dry and wet weights of the device without the anchoring weights? Oh, um, <clears throat> that's a good question. That is something I should uh, officially measure. The dry... <laughs> <laughs> the dry weight is probably about, like, I would say 10 pounds or something like that. Most of that weight is in the battery, which is a little brick. It weighs about five pounds or something like that. It's probably a little less, I would say, 
maybe seven to 10 pounds. And it's definitely buoyant when you put it underwater. That's why um, in that picture you see I have dive weights over the top of it because it's a big hollow tube. Um, but in that picture, uh, let me go back. So those are four, like four pound weights. But, so it, it's less than 16 pounds uh, negatively or positively buoyant when you put it underwater. Okay, and then I had one more question for you that goes back to your photo um, transect mm -hmm. uh, tool. Um, has that been used before for like drone footage? Um, we have a group here at ODFNW that's doing some work um, flying drones over the mud flats just to reduce the amount of sampling effort it takes to get out to those flats. I was just curious if that would be a technology that would be of interest. Um, you know, I don't know if, I know it was specifically developed to look at photos of coral. Um, I, I'm sure that there are some other tools that are like it that have been used for drone footage. Um, but that tool, yeah, was specific, specifically designed for these photo transects of coral reefs. Um, we have another question that's coming in that um, is asking what degree would be most useful for pursuing this type of research? And I'm curious um, whether this question was related to the biological aspects of this research or the engineering design. Mm -hmm. So if that person wants to ask that question um, and do a clarifying for me in the chat, I'll get to it. Uh, the biological aspects. Oh, okay. The, uh, I assume that this person is an undergraduate. Sounds sounds like a potentially. I, yeah. Um, well, <laughs> I I had got advice um, from somebody when I was an undergrad, and I said I really wanted to study oceanography, and they said the best thing you can do is not study oceanography as an undergrad, but really focus on some aspect of. Um, really focused on getting the fundamental sciences down. So I really liked the bioresource research program at Oregon State because it, um, uh, the base requirements was like one class shy of a minor in chemistry. So I ended up with a minor in chemistry. I took physics, uh, geology, um, water science classes, cellular biology, biology courses, um, I did take some oceanography courses as well. Um, and so getting that solid fundamental in, the, in all the sciences, because in marine science in particular, um, like my, my project, for example, all of these things come into play. So chemistry, physics, geology, um, biology are all kind of working together here. Um, and so having some really, uh, pursuing a degree that gives you fundamental knowledge and, and a lot of those different kind of core sciences is really useful. And then um, specializing in grad school um, in ecology or um, like my program at UC Santa Barbara is the inter interdepartmental gro graduate program in marine science. It's even hard for me to say. But um, the goal is of, of that is to like have students work in these different aspects of marine science. So biological, chemical, physical, geological aspects of marine science and kind of dive into them um, in more detail. But having that basis in the core sciences was really helpful. Thanks. We also have somebody who did some research that is, has some similarities to what you were working on and was hoping to have your contact information. Um, yep if you are comfortable giving that verbally or um, I can help you connect to this person offline. Sure, no, I, I'm comfortable. I could just write it in the chat maybe and then people can. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, let me open the chat. I guess I can. Oh yeah, um, and, and sign, I see Kevin, uh, Kevin wrote in. Um, the, Kevin taught me how to scientific dive and so he said scientific diving is really, really important. Um, to learn. A definitely... little plug from Kevin's program <laughs> yeah. as well. A little plug from Kevin uh, <laughs> to the DSO at OSU about uh, the dive, I'm the scientific diving program there. But I think I was Kevin's first class, 
scientific diving class at Oregon State. And uh, yeah, it was it's great. It really opened a lot of doors um, having that scientific diving training under my belt before going to grad school. Um, as Kevin is, or as uh, Kyle is entering that information, I just want to thank everybody who joined us online um, and uh, encourage you to come back uh, next week when we have our seminar, same time, same place. Um, but hang in there if you want to get Kyle's contact information. He's putting it in the chat now. Make sure that's sent to everyone, Kyle. Yeah, here we go. There it is. Thank you so much. Um, and Kyle, for you, just thank you so much for joining us and being a part of this. I know this is a hard format to uh, talk to yourself for an hour. Um, so we sure appreciate it and we appreciate your um, interest and knowledge and hope we'll actually see you in person uh, at Hatfield uh, sometime in the near future. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was, it was great. I wish I could have seen everyone in person. And um, Wonderful. And Bob Cowan, director of Hatfield Marine Science Center, just logged in so you can see him and he's saying thanks. Oh, great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Nice to All meet right. you virtually. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, Bob. I can unmute you. <laughs> oh. Okay, good. Yeah, Carl. Uh, actually, I was on for the whole talk. I enjoyed it very much. And, uh, great. Thanks. And I, I think it really did uh, give us a good idea of the um, interdisciplinary approach that, that we're very interested in promoting here and um, appreciate your, your participating in this. And I hope yeah. that our partnership will continue. Um, I, I hope so too. I'm, I'm happy to have been involved so far and to still be involved with getting the iLab set up and I'm looking forward well, to seeing you, where it goes. I hope things yeah. work out for you in, in Juneau. Um, oh, thanks. Yeah, your wife. And, um, but, you know, anyway, we will certainly uh, stay connected. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, I, uh, <laughs> I'm just glad to be part of it. I was so excited when, yep. when Cinnamon and Mark got in touch with me because um, it's, space this the space that we're setting up um at Hatfield is the space that I kind of wish I had had access to while I was doing a lot of my work it would have made building things like these water samplers and some other yeah. projects yeah. a lot easier it would have been really amazing so it's, it's pretty cool yep well again thanks very much and I I, I did enjoy your talk very much yeah. so, thank you thank you very much all right take care thanks Thanks, Cinnamon. All right. Always. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. Give me a couple days and I'll get it up online um, and you can share it as you need to. And Kyle, once again, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Cinnamon. Bye, everyone.